Hey everyone, my name is Stephanie Roldan, and welcome to Construction DEI Talks, a podcast where we'll talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion as it relates to the construction industry. Joining me as always are my co-hosts. Hey, Asha Baker-Bunch from Rosenden. Jorge Quesada from Granite Construction. And Abby Combs of Granite Construction. On each episode, we're going to open the floor for conversation with subject matter experts and industry professionals on how we can make our industry a more diverse and more inclusive place for everyone. But... Just so you know, this podcast may contain views and opinions, which are those of our guests and do not reflect the official policy or position of Granite, Rosenin, or its employees. We just have to say it. Just saying. So it's important to note that these companies are not liable for the opinions represented in this podcast. So as always, Construction DEI Talks is available through the generous sponsorship of Granite Construction and Rosenin. Now on with the show. Hey, everyone, and welcome back to Construction DEI Talks, the construction-centered podcast that focuses on our efforts on diversity, equity, and inclusion in the construction space. As always, we want to thank our sponsors. We have Rosenden, again, sponsoring us in season number two, and Granite Construction. Today, we have with us James McGibney, who's joining me, Stephanie Roldan, my co-host, Abby Combs, and Tay Baker-Bunch to share with us a little bit about what he's been doing lately, and most importantly, his views on allyship for women and women in construction, and how that sent him on a journey to taking down the most hated man on the internet and creating a safer space for women on the internet. So with that, welcome, James. Hi, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. So James, share maybe for our audience first, what it is that you do within Rosenden, because, you know, people might get a sense that your day job is is handling the internet and and keeping people safe, but really you have a day job here at Rosenden. So just share a little bit about that. Sure. So I'm the Senior Director of Cybersecurity and Compliance. I've been with Rosenden for now nine years. That's two Marine Corps enlistments. And before that, I've always been in construction. I was with Tudor Saliba, and then they turned into Tudor Perini. I was at Rudolph and Sletten, so we all run in the same small circles. But my job primarily is to keep hackers out of our Rosenin environment and keep our employees safe internally and make sure that they don't click on links that they maybe should not click on. That's awesome. And by the way, my best strategy, just so everyone knows, is just click on nothing, delete everything, and if somebody's looking for you, they'll find you eventually. That's right. And, you know, I'll never forget my my friend, Larry Beltramo, during board meeting, he made the best comment, which is, he really doesn't even read emails. If you need to get a hold of him, call him. And I'm like, that's great. I wish everyone was like that. I don't want to read emails. (laughs) That's the best strategy. Moving forward, Stephanie, if you email me or somebody, I I don't read emails. You have to call me. I'm going to put that like as a... a It's also a time management strategy. You know, you build your capacity by avoiding phishing scams. There you go. Good way to look at it. But yeah, and that's, you know, as we grow as a company, obviously we're getting, we're being targeted more and more. So, you know, we're always on high alert and, you know, we we do pretty well. I think as a company, I'm proud of the employees because we've started training, cybersecurity training, and that's been going on for years. And you can see the progression that our employees are making where they know now to double check an email when it's coming in from an external source and making sure that it's not a phishing email and reporting it when it is. So that's great. Yeah. And we're going to, we're going to talk a little bit about how you got to the Netflix series and the efforts you did around protecting women on the internet after, you know, they had taken actions that put themselves in unsafe positions. And so now you are starting to educate not only the people within our own organization, You do a lot of this work to keep people safe once they find themselves in situations where they bumped into not good people in their lives. But before we get there, I I actually want you to share maybe a little bit of the background of how you got there, James, because I think you have an interesting story about why this has become your life's mission. And as a part of that, I also think if you can share with us too, the moment where you felt or a time when you felt that you were different than others. Yeah, so I have a a well-publicized childhood that was less than optimal. 
You know, I remember the first experience of seeing something bad happening to a woman was when my dad beat the crap out of my mother with a frying pan, which is when we lived in New York City. And the New York City Police Department came and took my fully autistic brother and myself and put us into foster homes. And I actually never saw him again to this day. I've never seen him. And that's now been 40 years. But when that happened, I was put into the foster system in New York City. And the foster system in the late 70s, early 80s was atrocious. I remember living in a one bedroom, one bathroom house, if you would call it that, in the South Bronx. And there was about 23 other people in that house. And I was the only one who spoke English. And you would just start dealing with different types of abuse, just crazy childhood abuse. You know, they used to make me do things like kneel on hard lima beans for 12 hours straight. That might not sound like a big deal, but those lima beans will find the niches in your knees as you try to move. And, you know, there was just other really brutal physical abuse. I saw my stepsister, who at the time, I believe she was nine. Her name was Jenny. She was raped repeatedly in front of me. The foster dad at the time, this is an, an unfortunate story that's out there. Rolling Stone actually was the first one to cover it. It was a little jarring seeing it in writing. But when I was that same family that raped that girl, and it was the mother and the father that were doing this, by the way, the father one time dragged me into the bathroom, beat the crap out of me, actually knocked my front teeth out. And when I woke up, I was in a tub in the bathroom and there was water coming on me. And I was just trying to come through and there's blood everywhere. And I realized it was not shower water. It was this sick guy pissing on me. So you have these type of events that, and then I was homeless for a while in the South Bronx, which is great. But you have these events that happen and then you kind of compartmentalize them and you move on with your life. And all of those stories and things in my mind were very suppressed until the day when I saw Hunter Moore's website, isanyoneup.com, and that revenge porn. And then something snapped in me mentally, and it became my mission to completely destroy this guy's life, but also to get these women's images down as quickly as possible. Because I often think about that stepsister, Jenny, and I often wonder what happened to her, you know, what became of her. So I basically saw her when that site came up. Sorry, that was a super long answer. Well, one, I want to say thank you for your courage to share that story, right? Because there is probably thousands of people that go through traumatic experiences and one, don't feel safe to share it. Two, don't, to your point, maybe don't ever get over it or even acknowledge it. And to your point, you're right, you could, you could suppress it for a very long time and then it one day wakes up and it appears in sort of this way that isn't you anymore. And we've talked about it even in terms of when we think about mental health in the construction industry, it's one of the biggest challenges we have right now. And there's no doubt it's because we're all human beings and we're going through these events in our lives and we don't have a good way to talk about the trauma. I mean, that's simply what it is. It's trauma. And we don't spend enough time talking about that. And I want to thank you for coming on here because you're putting your trauma into a space now where you recognize that there is a lot that you can do in terms of allyship for women and speaking up for them and saying, hey, listen, this is this is not cool. Like no matter what anyone wants to say, this this website is trash, garbage, and this shouldn't exist to a point where you actually used your own capital to make that happen. Yeah. Yeah. And to take that even a step further, you know, since Netflix has come out, I've had a lot of women in Roseman, actually, who have reached out to me privately and had very similar stories of things that happened to them in the past. And they're now starting to come forward with it. But it's interesting because in the construction space, we joke around a lot. You'll hear a lot of curse words or just a lot of former military. That's just kind of how it's treated. But when you hear a guy make what he thinks to be an innocent joke, and it could be offensive to a woman, 
But if you take it a step further, it could be offensive to that woman because that just brought up things that she had suppressed for years. And now because of that joke where everyone's laughing, it actually extremely traumatic for her. So it was a little surprising, to be honest with you, to see how many employees at Rosenin have had really horrible childhood and upbringing. I guess that's why we all get along so well with each other. We can all relate in one way or another. James, so with Netflix and just a lot of the specials you have done, because you've done different shows on TV and everything like that too, not just about revenge porn, but cyberbullying and many different platforms of that nature. One of the things, especially considering your own personal trauma and a, a kind of a myth in the construction industry is therapy and people actually seeking help for trauma and triggers and, and their mental stability have you yourself been through therapy and being a person in the construction industry and every and military too, because that's also a stigma as well. How have you handled it and how do you help others who come to you? It's a great question. So I went to a psychiatrist once and walked out after five minutes. I was like, you know, I think they wanted to throw me out anyways within five minutes. Like this guy is beyond help. But I really never have because I think everyone has their own way that they deal with trauma. And some people feel that they can just go in and talk to someone and they can work through it. I'm more of a person of action. Like when I do something, I want to see those immediate results. So as crazy as this sounds, it's probably psychopathic in some ways. But when I saw Hunter site, it wasn't about, well, let me talk to him and, and see what we can do here. One way or another, that site was coming down. It was either going to be because he was offered a small amount of money to take it down or something else was going to happen. But there was no doubt in my mind that that site was coming down. And that was my therapy that made me feel better. So I think people, you know, it's always good to talk. I'm always all for people talking to other people if you have mental health issues. But you may come to find out that there's things that you do on your own that make you feel better about what you're getting ready to talk about. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, I think that's a, a good point that talking helps and being able to share. And I think you mentioned it earlier, you know, kind of feeling that commonality amongst your fellow teammates, you know, you just have a deeper level of trust. Can you share, you know, so you said you you prefer to do action and, and you saw Hunter's site. How did Bullyville come into play? Yeah. So the big thing with Bullyville, when the very first day when I started it, the goal was to not only go after Hunter Moore and his revenge porn website, there were also two other revenge porn sites that we went after and shut down and didn't pay a penny for those. I guess there's really no need to elaborate on this, but those sites went down and stayed down. And that was the whole main drive of Bullyville initially was to go after the worst of the worst on the internet. And then that quickly bled into parents contacting us who were stating that their 14 year old, I'll give you a prime example, a 14 year old girl, their daughter was being sextorted, sextortion online. And what had happened was she was friended by someone at Facebook from a neighboring school who saw her Facebook, told her, thought she was really smart. They started conversing back and forth for a good four or five months and had never seen each other. And then one day he went to the next level and said, hey, how about you send me a, a photo, a naked photo of yourself? I'll send you one of mine. She took one photo, sent it, and almost immediately regretted it before anything even really had happened. And the next day, come to find out that that kid from the neighboring school was actually like a 43-year-old pedophile who then demanded money from her, $1,000, or her photo was going to end up on everyone's Facebook page. He was going to put it on where her mom worked, where her dad worked, everywhere. It was going to disseminate it throughout the entire school. So I started getting more and more of those. And as much as I was focused on Hunter, I also wanted to go after these guys. And the problem was, you know, the police trying to go after these guys, submitting subpoenas, but then you get the results back from a subpoena and it's from an IP address in China. So you know that's not going to be of any help. So how do you identify that person? 
And that's where I come in and I have a unique set of skills that allow me to, to pretty much un unmask anyone. So then Bullyville shifted and we started going after all of these disgusting men. Let's actually talk about where you maybe think this is going next for you, James. Obviously, Hunter Moore is essentially been taken care of. Digitally, digitally. Digitally, yeah. yeah, that's right. He's digitally no longer sort of in your sights. You've done some really great work in terms of getting bully voile to the front and center. There's obviously some component, and I would assume this, I mean, because I know you're studying right now, you're you're trying to earn your doctorate so you can be Dr. James McGibney one day. So I, I get the sense that there is an educational component about this, sort of getting on the front end of this so that now we make sounder decisions. We don't fall for these manipulations. You talk to me all the time about don't give your daughter, you know, an iPhone or don't give her, you know, don't enable a device that can subjected to victimization like tell me where it's going next James yeah and, th and that's a good point about I think from my standpoint I'm actually at some point when I retire I would like to go become a professor at, at local university here at UT and it really is about education people think yeah you got to educate the kids so they know not to take that photo that's true no doubt about that but you really have to spend the time and educate the parents because in the aforementioned case about that 14-year-old girl, the parents didn't even know she had a second Facebook account. They had her login information to all of her social media, to her email. They had access to her phone. They had access to all this stuff, but they didn't realize that when she was over at a friend's house before weekends before, she had created that account. So it's really about making sure that parents understand, you know, especially in construction, you know, God bless this industry. You're going to have some older people who are from previous generations that really didn't have to deal with the Internet and the level of stalking that occurs, especially towards children. So parents, I want to make sure they're up to speed and understand just how dangerous the Internet truly is. If I could blow up the Internet tomorrow, I would do it. The Internet's a horrible place. <laughs> I don't like technology as is so we are here <laughs> yeah yeah we're here and there yeah <laughs> yeah it's, it's interesting because I went to uh this would have been my daughter's sixth or seventh grade year James and they had a gentleman come in to talk to us about how parents don't understand how exposed our children are not out of a matter of where they actually surf and actually go but as a matter of how they're tracked on the internet and other people find that and then send them things that generally speaking are not age appropriate. So he, they gave us a couple hints. Like one, if your child has an email address, just leave it in your adult name and make your age 65 because they're not looking for 65 year old people generally to go into these traps. So what are some things that you would say like right now to our audience of construction professionals who've got these younger kids or, or grandkids or whatever it is, what are maybe some things we should be considering and, and safeguarding them? Because it's not just their choices. It is other people around them, unfortunately, sending them stuff that leaves them no choice. Yeah. And it's a great point to take that even one step further. So I always tell parents to make sure to tell their kids, have two-step authentication on your accounts. Make sure that your accounts are private. So what I've noticed a lot is parents will have a wide open Facebook page and they will post an innocent picture of them and their kids out at the lake that past weekend. And they may have a 14 year old daughter who is in a bikini. And that photo, as innocent as it may sound, is posted on that parent's Facebook page and it's wide open. And next thing you know, You've got these pedophiles who now see this girl in a bikini who's clearly underage, and now they're in the process of, of finding out exactly who she is, where she goes to school, and that's how the stalking process starts. So the parents didn't even realize because they were innocently posting this photo and didn't realize the devastating and cascading effects it can have. 
Yeah, I think that's great advice. I have two small children that my husband and I do not post online and grandma on both sides cannot understand why she is not allowed to share photos. And so that's something that is hard to communicate to people who maybe don't understand all of that behind the scenes because it really, Facebook started out, it seemed as a great way to connect and share your photos. And I know when I moved away to college, you know, my mom could see what I was doing and it helped me feel connected to my family. So it does provide a lot of community aspect, but unfortunately there is this really gross dark underbelly that people take advantage of anything that you put out there. So yeah, good point. And the internet is just a very small piece of the actual net in general. The dark web is where the wild, wild west of the internet truly is. And parents will do sweeps of the internet and say, oh, my kids know we're there, we're safe. But they don't realize that the kids' photos are actually all over the dark web at different sites. And that's how these revenge porn sites basically are. That's how Hunter Moore's site was, you'd have an underage girl posted on his site, and then all of these pedophiles would then take it to the next degree, and they take that, and they put it on the dark web, and they would have contests. Who can rape this girl first gets $1,000, and here's her information that we found on isanyoneup.com. You know, I don't think a lot of people realize just how horrible sites like that are. They have suicide counters on these sites where if they find out a girl or a woman or a guy killed themselves, they will add that to the counter. So it is a horrific place on the internet. And the best advice I can give is try and keep your kids off of it as much as possible. You know, that's a hard task in today's day and age, but really make sure you understand all the internet traffic that is coming in and out of your house. So on your firewall, on your router, you can log in and you can look at the logs. And you can see every IP address that device has gone to and what's come back. Hackers find creative ways to get on networks. So that's the other thing I would suggest for people for your home network. You should have two networks. You should have your production network, which is your computer, basically, and that's it. And then everything else will go on the guest network. Your TVs that need firmware updates, whatever Internet of Things, IoT devices would go on that guest network because... A good hacker, let's let's present, let's pretend I'm gonna hack one of you guys. We'll just go through the process. I'm not saying I would ever do this, just a disclaimer. But if I were, there's steps I would do to identify who you were and your and what your network was. And then without going into specifics, I would get into your network. And once I'm in your network, if I'm on your guest network, I can't traverse to your production network. They're separate from each other. So I'm almost stuck at that point. Whereas a lot of people just put everything on one network. So my TV, my fridge, all of that is on the same network as the Rosen and laptop. And if I'm on one, I'm on all on that network. And I sit there for a while and I look at the traffic coming and going. And from a hacker's perspective, it's, a, it's usually a financial aspect you know, as well. They're trying to get your banking information. But if you get a hacker who is like a, a hunter more, so here's the thing with Netflix that I thought was pretty interesting how they portrayed it, because it's a very good point they made. Some women did voluntarily give a naked photo of themselves to a boyfriend in trust, never in a million years thinking that that boyfriend was going to be a complete scumbag. Hopefully that word doesn't get bleeped because it is a scumbag thing to do. So I'll say it again and take that photo and destroy that trust and post it on the Internet. Now. I've heard a lot of people say, well, that's the woman's fault. She should have known better than to take that photo. Okay, that's an argument that I guess some people could make. I, at the end of the day, I don't agree with it. But what makes it even scarier is there was a woman on there who I'm actually friends with uh, who's on the Netflix special. Her name was Danielle. And she had sent the photo to one person, but there was no way he did it. Come to find out from the FBI investigation, she was hacked. And Charlotte Law's daughter, same thing. She had never sent that photo anywhere. She was hacked. So someone hacked her account and then found the photo that she had never sent to anybody. So even when you think I'm just taking the photo for myself and no one's ever going to see it, there's a digital footprint. And a good hacker is going to find that and exploit that.
Yeah, you mentioned something a little bit ago because you said not just women, also men. And so we've highlighted a lot, you know, your allyship towards women, but inside of the work that you've done, you've also done it to protect men. And I think that's interesting in the fact that we all sort of need to create safety for everyone. And a woman who took and did the exact same action is as much a scumbag as a man for breaking trust, right? Like those are things that probably relationship wise are just bad behaviors altogether. But there's a humanity in this that it affects sort of all of us. And I could imagine that there are probably men in construction who have also had similar situations happen to them. And I don't want to forget that as you're extending this allyship to women, that you're also here for men. And it's probably a little bit harder for them to want to come to you, James, and say, hey, listen, I need your help. But I want it to be known. I'm sure, I'm sure it has happened. I'm sure it's it's harder. But I don't want people, and especially because we're going to have granite listeners, we're going to have rose into the listeners. I'm sure they're going to be like, oh man, I might need James' help at some time for my child, for myself, or whoever in their life. I want them to know that this is for everyone. Yeah, and we do it for free, by the way. So Bully will never charge us anyone. Now, as you can imagine, case in point, after Netflix came out, I have almost 4,000 unread emails to Bullyville that are almost identical as I was skimming through them. And then I was curious because I'm a statistical guy and working on my doctorate. So I have to pretend that I'm really into statistics. But this one I was into. And that was out of the four, that was 4,081 emails. How many of them were women and how many of them were men? And 91% are women. So then I was curious and just looked at the men's and the stories are so unique to the man. Like the women, it is the same type of story, but for the men, they always seem to acknowledge, yeah, I'm not hacked. I sent this photo to these women and one of them took them and put them online. Go figure it out. But they are always honest about it to where they say, yeah, I, I wasn't hacked. No one hacked me. I, I disseminated them. And it's a little more uncomfortable for some of them because I just had someone, I'm not saying if they're Rosen or not, but someone approached me on Monday. They are married with kids and they had a lull in their marriage, I guess, is the best way to put it. I'm no psychologist or psychiatrist, but that's the best thing I can gather. And they met someone online and, and it was an actual person. It wasn't a catfishing thing. And he sent some explicit photos and then they were together for a while. And then she was upset that he decided he was not going to leave his wife. So she put those photos on blast everywhere. And one thing I can tell you that Google is doing a great job of, if your naked images end up on the web, and you can clearly show that you did not put them there with a notarized affidavit would be a good example of what to do to, to combat that. If you submit that to Google, they'll take those images now. So same with Bing. So if there's an unauthorized photo of you, because you can simply hit them with a DMCA request, which is a copyright. Basically, you own the copyright. The digital copyright is you and your photo. You own it. So you have the legal right to it, Google will take it down. Where it gets a little trickier is when it's been put on the dark web. The dark web is not governed by anything or anyone. So that's a little bit tougher. James, you mentioned the dating sites, which I was, I was like, it's coming. I know it's coming because <laughs> that is a huge, you know, everything now is online. You want your food sent to you, done online. You want a date done online you want dinner and a date both can be done online <laughs> so you know and that's where I know a lot of things get tricky because and I will even say for men because I have a friend who recently is dealing with an issue where he sent some pictures and now he's finding them on LGBTQ plus sites and he's not that person so how does that work like if someone's like I found out through a friend that my pictures are on a whole other dating site that I'm not even on. <laughs> yeah, and the first thing to do would be to contact that site. And once again, if you just say, those are my images, that's not me, uh, it's impersonation, it's fraud. There are certain keywords that you have to use when you contact 
of these sites, especially a dating site, fraud, if it was hacked, hacked, unauthorized, DMCA, you put in those, a lawyer, hired court counsel, they'll usually take it down right away because they don't want to deal with the backlash, you know, of that. That's good advice. My question that I was going to ask is you mentioned like on your phone, you have a photo that wasn't meant for anyone. You didn't send it to anyone. How can we better protect our phones? I have a passcode. I don't change it. Give me some advice. Yeah. I mean, and from Rosenin's perspective, we have a lot of things in place for a Rosenin issued asset to make sure that that phone never gets hacked. But there are instances where I know people in construction, they have their own device that is not governed by a corporation. The things I could tell you are super important. Like you said, you know, have it locked down, change your passwords frequently. Where people get hacked a lot isn't on their phone, it's on their iCloud account. So if you go and look at a lot of these hacks that have occurred with revenge porn, your phone wasn't hacked. It was your iCloud account that was hacked because you did not have two-step authentication in place. So that two-step authentication for anyone in the audience who's not sure exactly what that means, my apologies for not explaining it sooner. Basically, if you go to log into your Gmail account, for example, if you have two-step authentication in place, you'll receive a notification on your phone verifying that you're the one who's attempting to log in. And that definitely will protect you from getting hacked on your phone or your iCloud account. A lot of those hacks that were, were attributed to anyone up that's exactly what happened. Their iCloud type account was hacked. There was no two-step authentication in place. And then that hacker has access to every... Think about how much stuff some of you, just who is listening, have within your iCloud account. And if you have your children's accounts tied in to your iCloud account, and everything is going to one central location. So if a hacker gets one, they get all. Thank you uh, for all of these wonderful, I think we all were writing down notes at one point because like, uh-huh. we all got kids. We're all like, oh God, oh God. And I remember you telling me back in 2019, James, about the separate networks. So I immediately had to go home back then and do it. So now my kids are mad because everyone's on this one thing and mommy's over here by herself. I got the good Wi-Fi. That's your yeah. business. <laughs> <laughs> That's your business. It's slow. That sounds like a personal, pro- get off the Wi-Fi, go outside, go play. So again, we appreciate everything that you have told us, our audience. I know that this has been amazing and super helpful. I got to end it with our most prestigious question, James, which I feel like in this moment, it's it's a big one. What would you like people to be? What would you like people to know? And what would you like people to do when it comes to cybersecurity, protecting themselves, just everything we talked about today? Be vigilant. Stay vigilant. Know what being vigilant means. And it's not only for you, like you said, with, you know, with your kids, it's for your family. You know, everyone is the chief information officer of their house. So one of the parents, if not both, are the technical officers of that house, of that environment. They are in charge of the data that's coming in and out of that house. They are in charge of what kids, what their kids are doing, what data they have, what they're on. You know, I think as long as you act as if, I always yell like the boiler room, or remember that movie with Ben Affleck? They're saying, act as if you're the CIO or CEO of this company. I tell people, act as if you are the chief information officer of your house and everything stops and goes through you from a digital perspective. And then lastly, just on a, on a pure personal note, you know, I, I'm sure it's a little difficult to hear some of the childhood stuff that I've gone through, but I'm sure everyone who's listening either has gone through something that's been traumatic or knows someone who has gone through something traumatic. And, you know, there's two ways you can funnel that, that trauma. You know, it can be in a bad way where you maybe go down the wrong path, or it can be in a positive way where you take those experiences and say, all right, it's really awful what happened, but I'm going to be better than that. I'm going to be better than what happened to me. And I'm going to spin it into a positive and turn that anger into action. I don't know how else to end it. That was the best way. So again, James, thank you so much. Thank you for creating Bullyville and for helping everybody around you. I speak for everyone in the world. We appreciate you. Thank you. And I I would be remiss if I didn't give Netflix their plug because they'll say something if I don't. 
Netflix, the most hated man on the internet, is out there now. It was in the top 10 right out of the gate. Stayed that way for about a week and a half. And then Stranger Things came along and knocked us clear out. But, you know, it's it's good to watch it. And I've been hearing from a lot of parents who, who their kids who are younger, 14, 15, and 16, where they've had to watch it because they want them to see the cause and effect of something as traumatizing as naked images ending out on the web. So I think it's a good learning tool in my personal opinion. I'm a narcissist, so of course I want everyone to see it for my own edification. But, you know, I think if you have kids and, and you feel it's appropriate after you watch it, it shakes kids to their core. I've had parents tell me that, that some of the kids are like, I don't even want to touch my phone right now for a couple of weeks. It shows you just how horrible the internet can be. Where can listeners find you, James, and follow what's going on with Bullyville? Yes. Yeah, so you go right to bullyville.com. If you go to isanyoneup.com, which was Hunter's revenge porn site, I now own that. That goes to me. His second revenge porn site that he tried to put together is Anyone Up 2. That now goes to me. And all of those photos that he had that he was going to post on Is Anyone Up 2, they magically vanished. I don't know what happened there, but they're gone. He's gone. And on we go. And uh, I know you don't like social media, but do you have any? <laughs> there is an Instagram account now. I, I'm not a social media fan, but if you just go to Instagram.com slash Bullyville, we just started using it. So yeah, you're more than welcome to reach out to me there if you'd like. Sounds good. Thank you so much for joining us today, James. All right, guys. Thank you. Yeah. And as always, we thank Rosenden and Granite for their generous sponsorship of our podcast. Be inclusive and we'll see y'all later. Thank you everyone for joining us on today's episode of Construction DEI Talks. We hope you'll listen in again soon. If you'd like to learn more about how you can make the construction industry a better place to work, please visit our website, Construction DEI Talks, or reach out to us on Twitter, LinkedIn, or Instagram. There you will find more information on the latest development in diversity, equity, and inclusion. You can find our webpage and email address and links to social media in the show notes. We'd love to hear from you. So be sure to rate us, give us a review, and above all, subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss out on any future episodes. So we'll catch you next time on Construction DEI Talks. Thank you for listening. And as always, be inclusive.